ladies and gentlemen, well, first I would uh, like to second Sean Gabb in his thanks uh, to uh, Hans and Gulchin for their uh, splendid hospitality yet again and for having invited me to everyone's favorite uh, conference. Um, it's the only conference I know where there's a coffee break uh, between each. Uh, uh, and if I were dictator of the world, I would make that compulsory uh, throughout the world. Well, my uh, subject uh, today is a slightly odd one, um, namely that of uh, Freud and freedom. And if you hear any screams of protest, uh, it's only my wife, or perhaps I should say uh, it is my wife, because there's a big difference between it's only my wife and my wife. <laughs> As I'm sure Freud would have noticed. <laughs> Actually, I'm uh, using uh, Freud a bit as a stalking horse for a wider subject, that of psychology and freedom, because uh, psychology is, psychologists tend to be very determinist, and one way of changing people is by uh, forcing them uh, to change. Uh, many schools of uh, psychology have claimed to liberate mankind, but in uh, actual fact, they often have the opposite effect, and possibly intention. Well, let me start by quoting a visitor to Freud's last residence. His last residence was a house in London, in a street called Maresfield Gardens in Hampstead, in uh, London. And uh, this visitor had written in the visitor's book, because it's uh, now a museum, it's the Freud Museum. He said, I'm glad he wasn't my father. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't uh, give the reasons for his relief, um, so we can only speculate as Freud himself uh, would have done. Incidentally, and, and uh, if there's one thing that uh, I would like you to take away from this little lecture, uh, let me recommend as very interesting and instructive reading the visitors' books of exhibitions. They're often much more interesting than the exhibitions themselves. And, of course, the people who write in them are um, a self-selected sample of humanity. But it is in these books uh, that you will learn uh, several unsuspecting uh, things. Uh, at Schiphol Airport, for example, in Amsterdam, there's a little branch of the Rijksmuseum uh, where they show on a rotating basis not the greatest works of the uh, Golden Age, but minor ones which are still uh, wonderful. And it's an excellent idea for the amusement of passengers with an hour or two to kill between flights. Uh, from the visitor's book, you will apprehend the true banality of many people's thoughts, um, uh, for they uh, wish to communicate these thoughts, to, to immortalize them. And they say they write things in the book of the Rijksmuseum, uh, USA is best or, hello, I'm from Japan. <laughs> and once you have uh, read this uh, visitor's book, you will begin to understand why our politicians are so deeply uninteresting, because they are truly representative of us. <laughs> Um, and again, in, uh, there was an exhibition in Birmingham Art Gallery which was dedicated to the portrayal of blacks in British art in the 18th and 19th century. And I'd expected this exhibition to be a kind of festival of political correctness, but I was surprised to find it very beautifully and sensitively uh, curated. It was a wonderful exhibition. But in the visitor's book, I read the comments of two black women uh, they, were in, they followed one another. The first said that she was thankful to God that she lived to see the day when an exhibition such as this would show the world the beauty of black people and their dignity. And immediately below, the comment below, was that the whole exhibition was deeply racist and demeaning to and derogatory of black people and of course was the exactly the same exhibition. And this shows 
that the same phenomenon can evoke very different interpretations in uh, different people and that you can read almost anything into anything and that preconceptions or mindsets are often more important than mere evidence. And this brings me uh, back to Freud, one of the most uh, powerful criticisms of whom is that he did not so much uh, find what there was to be found, uh, like Columbus uh, setting out into the sea, or perhaps I should say the swamp of the human mind, um, but he was more uh, someone who was determined to implant what he claimed to have found. And there's abundant evidence of this, even in his own words. I don't have to make an interpretation, I can just quote Freud. Here, for example, is what Freud wrote to his great friend, the ENT surgeon Wilhelm Fleece, about a patient with circumoral eczema. This is eczema around the mouth whose dermatological illness he had been caused, he believed, by acts of fellatio forced on her by her father when she was a very small child. When I thrust the explanation at her, she was at first won over. Then she committed the folly of questioning the old man himself, who at the very first intimation exclaimed indignantly, are you implying that it, I was the one who did this to you? And swore a holy oath of his innocence. She is now in the throes of the most vehement resistance, claims to believe him, but attests to her identification with him by having become dishonest and swearing false oaths. I have threatened to send her away and in the process convince myself that she has already gained a good deal of certainty, which she is reluctant to acknowledge. I don't think I need to elaborate very far on the sheer intellectual dishonesty of this that Freud reveals. Denial of his interpretation is taken as confirmation of it. There seems to be no awareness of a need for a criterion to distinguish between the non-acceptance of an interpretation as a psychological denial of what is true, a kind of refusal to accept the truth, and denial of an interpretation because it is factually false. Without such a criterion, interpretations are of a nugatory value and are entirely arbitrary. And the man who makes them and insists upon them is more evangelist than scientist. Not only did Freud thrust his explanation on his patient, which in the circumstances is a rather odd word to use, um, perhaps a Freudian slip, um, but he threatened to break off relations with the patient unless the patient accepted what he said. Now, Freud, of course, was a very brilliant man. He was very cultivated. He was a beguiling writer. He said of his famous long cases, incidentally, there are only four. The whole of psychoanalysis, uh, there are only really four cases that uh, Freud uh, describes in any detail. Uh, he said that they read like uh, novels, and this is certainly true. Uh, he, in fact, would probably never have become a psychiatrist if he could have continued to fund his early uh, neuroanatomical studies, in which he was very gifted. He was a very gifted neuroanatomist. Um, but he needed to earn a living, and he went into clinical work. But from an early age, he displayed an avidity and impatient, impatience to succeed on a vast scale, not just to be a, a successful scientist, but to be a world famous uh, scientist. The episode of his ardent but hasty and irresponsible advocacy of the newly uh, discovered cocaine as a treatment for morphine addiction, when there was really no evidence whatsoever in favor of this, uh, is again evidence of this trait in him. If 
uh, his treatment had succeeded, of course. Uh, he, his, um, his fame around the world would have been uh, guaranteed, immediate, and, and secure. Uh, but in fact, the treatment um, uh, in, um, promoted the death of a surgeon called uh, von Fleischel Marxhoff. So the hist the, uh, uh, this jumping to conclusions was something, I mean, he didn't, Jumping to conclusions is perhaps the wrong uh, uh, expression. He concluded that he must jump, really. <laughs> and, this was, uh, and this was something that he did throughout his life. The historical evidence against uh, Freud is extremely damning. Uh, for example, to take the cocaine treatment, he wrote in the press in praise of it when he knew that it was very dangerous. There is absolutely no doubt about this whatsoever. And this is for a doctor to advocate treatment which he knew to be dangerous, merely uh, to pursue fame. And it's hardly possible to, for a doctor to do anything much worse. Now, the charges against Freud are very well known. Uh, the evidence is conclusive, again, that he was untruthful in many of his reports. Uh, and he knew that he was being untruthful. That is to say, he was a conscious liar. There's no possible other interpretation in the difference between what he was publishing for the public and his private correspondence. This does not necessarily mean that he did not believe in the truth of his own theories, uh, which he supported with untruthful uh, reports of cures. He knew perfectly well, for example, that in the case of Anna O, uh, uh, the results were not as he described, and that she suffered from psychic disturbances for much, uh, for many years after he had declared publicly that she was cured. And the same is true of the famous case of the wolf man, who underwent uh, 60 years of psychoanalysis on and off, but 60 years, and does not appear at the end to have been in any better shape than he was at the beginning. But of course, it, it, perhaps it didn't go on for long enough. <laughs> it was brought to a premature close. <coughs> By death, incidentally. Uh, but uh, we have to recognize that fraud in scientific research is more common than we think, uh, and in some cases, at any rate, the perpetrator is so convinced of the truth of his theories that he is willing to manipulate the evidence which he publishes. Uh, in other words, he believes that there's a higher truth which trumps the lower truth, as it were. Nevertheless, by the time of his death in 1939, Freud was viewed very widely in the Western world as a great liberator of mankind from the dark forces of psychological repression that had until then oppressed it. Uh, and the locus classicus of this belief, perhaps, is the poem by the great English poet W.H. Auden uh, that he wrote very shortly after Freud's death, and it's entitled In Memory of Sigmund Freud. This poem summed up the general feeling about Freud, at least among uh, literary intellectuals, intellectuals of our kind, I suppose. According to Auden, when Freud died, only hate was happy, hoping to augment his practice now and his dingy clientele who think they can be cured by killing and covering the garden with ashes. Again, according to Borden, Freud was an enemy of those who hated in this way because he was able to uncover the sources and thereby, of their hatred and thereby overcome the effect of it. Of course, those who hated are still alive, but in a world he changed simply by looking back with no false regrets. All he did was to remember like the old, like the old, and be honest like children. Well, as a description of Freud's actual practice, 
This could hardly have been further from the truth. Indeed, it's almost laughably untrue, as we shall soon uh, see. Auden continues, he wasn't clever at all. He merely told the unhappy present to recite the past like a poetry, uh, less till sooner or later it faltered at the line where long ago the accusations had begun and suddenly knew by whom it had been judged, how rich life had been and how silly, and, li and was life forgiven and more humble, able to approach the future as a friend without a wardrobe of excuses. When everyone was psychoanalyzed then, or at least had a good grasp of psychoanalytical theories, man would be freed at last from what William Blake called the mind-forged manacles, those psychological barriers, self-generated, that keep man enslaved. The utopian hopes placed in Freud's psychology are illustrated by Auden's following lines. If he succeeded, why the generalized life would become impossible, the monolith of state be broken and prevented the cooperation of avengers. In other words, once man became psychically healthy, his complexes dissolved uh, by means of psychoanalysis uh, or awareness of doctrine, because of course, psychoanalysis itself would clearly be impossible for great masses of people. Uh, Freud, for example, spent uh, six hours a week for four years uh, simply to analyze the, uh, uh, the wolf man, which suggests that psychoanalysis could never really uh, become a, a public health measure like vaccination. Um, but once man had become uh, psychically healthy, he would be free uh, and political defamations such as totalitarianism would no longer be even conceivable for him. Um, when Auden wrote, uh, Freud, he said, was now more a uh, no, no more a person now but a whole climate of opinion. And that climate was one in which liberation from inhibitions and irrational prohibitions, restraint and so forth, uh, would be overcome. Freud himself would, was actually would not have been so sanguine. Um, and perhaps a man is not to be held responsible for the uh, interpretations that others put on his words. But that is the general uh, cultural effect of Freud, even if he didn't intend it. Now, as a clinician, Freud wanted or claimed to be able to free people from the neuroses that blighted their lives. He wanted to replace, uh, he said he wanted to replace uh, neurosis with ordinary unhappiness. <laughs> Uh, all of us are uh, surely familiar with habits or patterns of conduct which are harmful to us and which we wish we could overcome but find it difficult to do so. I mean, is there anyone in this room uh, to whom that does not apply? Uh, the habit, for example, of not telling the truth. Um, in general, we don't know the origin of these bad habits and wish we were free of them. Uh, and we sometimes even feel uh, enslaved by them. Uh, sometimes our struggles are rewarded and sometimes uh, they're not. But it was not Freud who discovered that we do not know the origins of our own thoughts and impulses. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I think it is likely, my own view is that we will never know this. The mystery of mankind, man, man will always remain a mystery to man. That is my view, uh, for rather metaphysical reasons. Now, the claims uh, of psychoanalysis to be effective are, of course, rather difficult to evaluate. No doubt there are many people who claim to feel better after having had it. Uh, and if you've been in treatment for four years, uh, for six days a week, you rather are inclined to think it's made you better. Because um, I should say that... Uh, a payment exerts a wonderful placebo effect. Um, and controlled trials are nearly impossible uh, to perform. Uh, 
Uh, we know, moreover, that success in treatment in psychological disturbances does not mean that the theory on which that treatment was based are true or correct. For example, exorcism by spiritualists often made people make people better, uh, provided, of course, that they believe in spirits in the first place, in the possibility of spirits. And I did actually meet a man, in fact, I was on television once with him, who claimed to have been trans tra transformed from a man who was uh, psychopathically violent to someone who helped old ladies uh, over the road by having vomited a little green creature uh, from his stomach. And uh, the interviewer said, well, what do you think of that then, doctor? <laughs> I said, not on the National Health Service. Um, it is not the curative claims of Freud, however, to which I want to draw your attention now, uh, though I will note en passant that detailed research into the fates of early patients of psychoanalysis does not support his claims, quite the reverse. And it is also notable that a very high percentage of early analysts, much higher than can be explained by chance, uh, committed suicide. And this is not, of course, to say that analysis caused suicide uh, because they might have been so inclined in the first place. That's why they were attracted to psychoanalysis. And it's a self-selected group. But at the very, late, at the very least, uh, it's not a good advertisement uh, for psychoanalysis. I wanted to point out, however, that in his attitude to history and remaking history, Freud was the joint first totalitarian of the, 19th, uh, of the 20th century. Of course, he had no means to enforce his will on anything like the scale of Lenin or Stalin, and um, I, I wouldn't want to say that he, in, he wished to do so, of course. Uh, but in his own small sphere, he did so, and really, uh, Lenin and Stalin had nothing to teach Freud uh, from the point of view of technique of uh, manipulating and rewriting history. It was noted very early in Freud's um, career, in psychoanalysis's career, uh, that it was not a theory or technique like any other. It was cultish from the first. It was more like a, uh, a cult church. This is what the psychiatrist Alfred Hocher wrote in 1910 in a paper with the title a psychological epidemic among doctors. A great number of disciples, some clearly fanatical, have, present, have presented themselves to Freud. To speak of this as a Freudian school is in reality completely misplaced, as it is a question not of facts which are scientifically provable or demonstrable, but of articles of faith. In truth, it is a community of believers, a sort of sect, with all the characteristics that go along with this. What is common with all the members of the sect is the high degree of veneration for the master. And the very distinguished psychiatrist Eugen Bleuler wrote in 1911 to Freud, the who is not for us is against us. The all or nothing is in my opinion necessary for religious communities and useful for political parties, but I consider it harmful for science. And there are many other testimonies to the same thing. Freud also recognized, himself recognized psychoanalysis as a movement from the very first. He called it a movement. And this is surely uh, very odd for a supposed scientist. No one would talk of the antibiotic movement. Uh, Freud was among the first to recognize the truth of the Orwellian dictum that he who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. And again, the evidence is overwhelming that he changed and manipulated his own biography and the history of the movement to suit his needs of that particular moment. One of his favored techniques, for example, was that of writing people out of the history of uh, psychoanalysis um, and of its so-called discoveries to make it look as if he were completely isolated and no one had ever thought anything 
compar uh, comparable uh, before. In 1909, for example, he called Joseph Breuer, who incidentally was a, uh, was a great physiologist um, and with whom he wrote studies in hysteria. He called him the co-founder of, psy uh, uh, of psychoanalysis and in fact said that really he was the first person to, to found uh, psychoanalysis. But a few years later, he was abusing him as a man who had no courage and uh, who uh, failed uh, science and who refused to go along with psychoanalysis from moral and intellectual ca cowardice. And the Stalinist school of photography in which you remove people who were formerly uh, your comrades um, uh, as time goes by, and in, in China you can put them back as well, and um, um, had nothing to learn, uh, had nothing to teach uh, Freud in this respect. He was conspiratorial. He formed a secret committee. It was called such, it was like a, a Politburo actually, and he gave intaglio uh, rings, gold rings, to each of its members as tokens of fealty. Uh, and its purpose was to defend the purity of psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic doctrine and to protect it from attack, using only ad hominem arguments against its detractors, never addressing the criticisms as if they were possible genuine objections, but always uh, referring to these uh, objections as if they were symptoms of mental disorder resistance, denial, projection, and so forth. His uh, opponents, and this is literally true, were ex officio deemed to be neurotic or pre-psychotic or paranoid, latently homosexual, that was a favorite, and, um, and they were forbidden from attending um, uh, psychoanalytic meetings. They were excluded, and excluded also from publishing in psychoanalytic journals. Anyone who disagreed with him was excommunicated. And this happened to many of his closest collaborators, such as Fleiss, Jung, Adler, Steckel, Ferencsai, and many others. Opposition to the doctrines of psychoanalysis was by means of diagnosis of the opponents rather than refutation of their objections uh, was his, his method. And I think we can, we can see that uh, that bears some analogy with what went on in Russia and other places. Now, of course, it would be grossly unfair to compare the practical effect of Freud's excommunications with those of Lenin, Stalin, and other uh, dictators, because, of course, he didn't have political power, and I don't think he ever sought political power except within his uh, movement, so he was not clearly a, a threat in the same way as, as the other um, totalitarians. Um, nevertheless, there is an underlying similarity of method, at least in the intellectual sphere. And curiously, Freud frequently used one of the psycho psychological defense mechanisms that psychoanalysis uh, classified, and actually its classification of defense mechanisms was perhaps, it, in my view, one of its best aspects. That mechanism was projection. He accused his opponents of doing precisely what he himself was doing, and this happened over and over again. He accused them of persecuting him, when in fact he was persecuting them. But he said that his persecution was defensive persecution rather than offensive persecution. Moreover, as I said, he he um, exaggerated the level of isolation and opposition that he suffered uh, in the early years of psychoanalysis and in the process uh, exaggerated his own uh, contributions in a very grandiose uh, way. Among other telling curiosities, but I think it is very telling, many of the Freud papers in the Library of Congress have been closed to public inspection and by researchers until the year 2113. This is surely an embargo worthy of a totalitarian government. Uh, 
or, or certainly of a movement. And no one would make such an embargo or put such an embargo uh, without many skeletons in his uh, cupboard or the cupboard of the movement that he founded. So Freud denigrated, excommunicated, falsified, minimized, concealed, lied, distorted history, embargoed, and resorted constantly to that ad hominem, which is something, of course, that I would never do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure no one in this audience would ever do. Um, in a way uh, in, of which Stalin might have been proud or at least not ashamed. And it is curious that Auden, who was certainly no fool, uh, should have taken him as an apostle of freedom uh, rather than as a man who uh, uh, excelled in the arts of uh, totalitarianism. Uh, but then, of course, we, we may cry with... Uh, I, would, I would say that to adopt sli adapt slightly the uh, possibly apocryphal uh, um, dictum of Edmund Burke, all that it is necessary for totalitarianism to triumph is for people to mistake its practitioners for liberators. But we may cry with Madame Roland, O liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? But I hope that in uh, what I have said today, you will ca perhaps catch a glimpse of why the visitor to Maresfield Gardens uh, might have said, I'm glad he wasn't my father. <laughs> Thank you very much.